I'm Matt, and welcome to The Good Trouble Show. Everyone knows we like to talk about all things politics. We also like to talk about UAPs, otherwise known as UFOs. Today, we have a jam-packed show with some exclusive truth bombs ready to drop on you about what has been happening behind the scenes with Congress, government whistleblowers, including David Grush, and perhaps most importantly, something going on at the Pentagon's UAP office, Arrow, that Congress and you should frankly be concerned about. And later in the broadcast, former United States Air Force Captain, Nuclear Launch Control Officer David Shindley will join us to reveal what happened during his testimony to Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick and his Arrow team. Now, but first, do us a solid and hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter, all that good stuff. Leave a comment, share, like. All of that helps get our message out. You know, we're pretty new, and uh, all of that really does help, believe it or not. And we also need to need a little help keeping the lights on. So you can become a supporter of The Good Trouble Show by going to, we'll put it up here, uh, www.patreon.com forward slash The Good Trouble Show. All right, let's turn that off there. Um, yeah, so for the price of a Starbucks, you can help support the show, and we really do appreciate it. Also on YouTube, for all of us that are joining us on the live stream, Super Chats are open and a great way to show your appreciation for our work to bring you great content. Now, on with the show. This, this show is going to be a little bit different in that we're going to share some significant news, or what we think is significant news about Arrow. And, uh, Part of what I'm going to talk about here is just give a little backstory because we do have a lot of viewers that are not, um, have not been tracking the whole UAP issue, especially as it relates to Congress. So hang with us here. This will be about 10 minutes, and then we're going to get to Captain Shindley to find out what happened with his experience with Arrow. And I think you're going to, frankly, be um, probably pretty shocked and surprised. Okay, now, reports of otherworldly things in our skies go back to the Bible and probably before. During World War II, fighter pilots over Europe began reporting unidentified flying objects interacting with their air air aircraft and dubbed them Foo Fighters, and we're not talking about the band. Yeah, you had other high-profile events, such as the Roswell crash, and the public demanded answers before you knew it. The Air Force launched public investigations into this phenomenon with Project Sign, Project Grudge, and finally Project Blue Book, ending in 1969. So at the end of all this, the Pentagon basically said, uh, hey, hey, there's uh, nothing to see here, folks, but swamp gas, balloons, and seagulls. The public thought the government was no longer investigating UAPs until the bombshell article on the front page of the New York Times, Glowing Auras and Black Money, the Pentagon's mysterious UFO program, revealed that, what? Guess what? The Pentagon had a secret UFO program to study the whole phenomenon that had been interacting with our military. Now, Congress demanded answers from the Pentagon, and the UAPTF, or UAP Task Force, was created to report to Congress on the UAP phenomenon. Now, following the dissolution of the UAPTF, Senators Kirsten Gillibrand and Marco Rubio passed legislation creating a full-time office in the Pentagon to investigate UAPs, and on June, uh, sorry, July 20th, 2022, the All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, otherwise known as ARO, and we know the government loves all these acronyms, was established. Led by physicist Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, Senators Gillibrand and Rubio passed further legislation providing whistleblower protection where any current or former employee of the government or government contractor that had an experience with UAPs or were part of any sort of covert government program related to UAPs could provide protected testimony to ARO without fear of violating any sort of national security non-disclosure agreement. And, um, you know, and for those of you that, that don't know, these, these agreements were super serious. Uh, if you violated them, let's say you, you were on a, uh, a nuclear missile wing, which our upcoming guest was, and you had an incident where uh, a UAP disabled your missiles. Uh, the Air Force Office of Special Investigations would typically force these Air Force officers to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And if you broke that agreement, it was prison time in Leavenworth, $10,000 fine, 
uh, loss of your security clearance. And, you know, for most of these folks that, you know, that work in this, uh, you know, in this world, that security clearance is what gives them uh, employment opportunities uh, in, that, in that realm moving forward. So it's a big deal. Now, this was in response to Senators Gillibrand and other senators who had mili military members actually come into their offices with stories of encountering UAPs and suffering reprisals by their chain of command for reporting these events. Now, Congress's efforts continued, and in 2023, based on information received by Gillibrand and Rubio, that the Pentagon had actually been illegally running decades-long legacy UFO crash retrieval and back engineering programs, they added an amendment that would essentially cut funding for those programs. This was followed months later by an amendment from the top Democrat, Senator Chuck Schumer, and leading Republican Marco Rubio, setting up a commission to review and declassify UAP, which, again, for most people know as UFOs, related documents. The legislation used the phrase non-human intelligence 24 times. I mean, that's insane. 24 times. It is a really big deal. But... What was a huge deal is that it addressed the legacy UAP programs directly by stating that the United States would exercise eminent domain over any recovered UAP technology and biological evidence of non-human intelligence held by a private contractor. So if you're Lockheed Martin, and uh, notice my camera's uh, dropping in and out of focus, so sorry about that. Uh, so if you're Lockheed Martin and you were given a craft to back engineer, let's say 50 years ago, uh, the government could finally come back and say, you know what, we're taking this thing back. Now, on June 5th of 2023, a big bombshell dropped on Washington and the world when the debrief published an article by New York Times writers Leslie Keene and Ralph Blumenthal, who wrote that original New York Times article titled, Intelligence officials say U.S. has retrieved craft of unknown origin. In it, former high-ranking intelligence official David Grush of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, or GSA, revealed that the government had deeply buried covert programs to recover and back-engineer craft of unknown origin, and that the government had a ton of these vehicles not made by human hands in their possession. He had additionally filed complaints with the DOD, Department of Defense, and IC, intelligence community inspector generals, one of which was so alarmed by the evidence he deemed the case credible and urgent. Grush also appeared in an extensive News Nation piece with journalist Ross Coltart, who's a personal hero of mine, where he revealed even more shocking details about what he had uncovered while working at the NGA. Now, all of this came to a head when Grush testified under oath this summer in front of Congress and had this to say. The UAP task force director asked me to identify all special access programs and controlled access programs, also known as SAPs and CAPs, uh, we needed to satisfy our congressionally mandated mission, and we were direct report at the time to the DEPSEC DEF. At the time, due to my extensive executive level intelligence support duties, I was cleared to literally all uh, relevant compartments and in a position of extreme trust, both in my military and civilian capacities. Uh, I was informed in the course of my official duties of a multi-decade uh, UAP crash retrieval and reverse engineering program, uh, to which I was denied access to those additional read-ons when I uh, requested it. I made the decision, based on the data I collected, to report this information to my superior, superiors and multiple inspectors general and, in effect, becoming a whistleblower. Well, Mr. Gresh, finally, do you believe that our government is in possession of UAPs? Uh, absolutely, based on interviewing uh, over 40 witnesses over four years. And, and, and where? I know the exact locations, and, and those locations were provided to the inspector general and some of which to the intelligence committees. I actually had the people with the firsthand knowledge um, provide a protective disclosure to the inspector general. Wow. Okay, so now... Keep in mind, folks, that Grush was under oath. Grush could have been charged with perjury if he was lying to Congress. 
That is serious stuff. Now, perhaps the most crucial point at the hearing was that Grush claimed these illegal programs were squirreled away in private aerospace and defense contractors controlled by around 50 non-elected government officials spread in nodes uh, throughout the government who acted as sort of gatekeepers for this entire thing, keeping it hidden from Congress. Now, by the way, this hearing did not sit so well with Aero Director Sean Kirkpatrick responding with what I would characterize as a pretty passive-aggressive post about Grush and the hearing on his LinkedIn account. David Grush wasn't the only one revealing a crash recovery program. This is from my brother from another mother, Jeremy Corbell, and his partner, legendary journalist George Knapp, interviewing the former director of another Pentagon UAP program, OSAP, on their podcast, Weaponized. Watch this. Is you're officially allowed to tell us that the United States government has in its possession a craft of unknown origin and you are able to access the inside. Is that correct? The wording that you you read is correct. Ah, you're going beyond the wording. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm asking you, did yes, that meeting I'm... happen? And oh, is it course. true? And it's true. Yes. yes. Okay, so you, you're, you're telling us, you told us, because you were allowed to tell us, that our government has a UFO in its possession and has been able to access the inside of it, right? Yes. Wow. Okay. So... I know this is a bit long-winded here, but I think it's important. Let's, let's stop for a moment and digest all of this. So Congress passed legislation on UAP that is now federal law and has legislation that is about to, additional legislation that is about to become uh, federal law in 2024. You had one of the highest ranking former intelligence officials that revealed the existence of legacy back engineering programs managed by a group of gatekeepers that had U.S. aircraft, or sorry, that, that the U.S. had these uh, craft made by non-human hands. And he filed whistleblower complaints with two inspector generals, testified in front of Congress about it. Then you had a former Pentagon UAP program uh, director who was, uh, who was just on uh, with uh, Jeremy Corbell, Jim, uh, uh, James, uh, uh, James Lukaski, I think, uh, who, who goes on public record about this same legacy back engineering program supporting Grush's claims. Now, we were the first to report that multiple other UAP whistleblowers had filed protected disclosures with the inspector generals about legacy UAP crash retrieval and back engineering programs. These folks completely bypassed Aero. And then you had this from the director of Aero, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick. Here we go. I should also state clearly for the record that in our research, Arrow has found no credible evidence thus far of extraterrestrial activity, off-world technology, or objects that defy the known laws of physics. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah. So uh, people, people wondered if Kirkpatrick uh, and his office, mandated by Congress to investigate the UFO phenomenon, would do its job in good faith. I mean, after all, we've seen decades of lies by our government, which ran similar programs. But after one year and three months since Arrow's formation and what I just learned about Arrow, it's time for Congress to ask one question. Question. Congress and your, and this is, I'm addressing Congress and the staffers. Who is pulling the strings and at Arrow and why? And let's dig into this. Now, first consider that Arrow was established under the office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, or OUSDINS. The same office whistleblower Lou Elizondo noted was the primary source of administrative terrorism used against whistleblowers or anyone who got too close to the truth. The director of Arrow, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, was, as most people may not know, installed by former acting director OUSD-INS David M. Taylor, who's now retired out of government, he's in the private sector now, and, of course, Ronald Moultrie, who, by the way, was on the advisory board of the government contractor Battelle. By all accounts, Battelle has been involved in legacy UAP back engineering programs. Now, right out of the gate, Arrow seemingly had no comms plan, like absolutely none. There was no public-facing interface other than a Twitter page with only one post. And even today, there's, I think there's only that one post. No, and on the Twitter page, no information on how you go about contacting Arrow. 
One source uh, told us that Moultrie would not approve any posts to their Twitter page. The Arrow website was also allegedly delayed due to Moultrie's slow walking of that project. Another source indicated that in Arrow's first year of existence, they barely spent any of their budget. There was no spend plan. Now, this dysfunction appeared to be by design, with one congressional source telling us that OUSDINS thought Congress would lose interest in the UAP topic, so the program was, well, just kind of set up to fail. Only recently, Under Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hicks had to finally step in to get a freaking website up, and that was only about a month ago. Now, one would think that following Grush's sworn testimony and the fact that his case was deemed credible and urgent by the intelligence community inspector general, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick would be begging Grush to testify to Arrow. I mean, seriously. I mean, after all, he could save Kirkpatrick a shit ton of time getting to the bottom of what the Pentagon really knows about the UFO phenomenon and these alleged programs that are managed by these gatekeepers. And, I mean, look, if, if I were the head of the Pentagon program, if I were directing Arrow and tasked with reporting to Congress on the UAP issue, I would have put Grush on the first flight to D.C., thrown him in a skiff, and had him testifying on record in no time. So, here's a question. Has anyone from Arrow reached out to whistleblower David Grush? The answer is no. No one from Arrow, including its leader, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, has reached out to David Grush or his attorney via any form of official communication. None. Zilch. Not an email, not a phone call, or even a, a message from a carrier pigeon. Absolutely nothing. It's crazy. Instead, Kirkpatrick is going around Washington, D.C., or having his uh, underlings do it, whispering that Grush should visit him in a way that's kind of reminiscent of that, you know, frankly, kind of shitty, passive-aggressive post on LinkedIn. So think about it. One of the highest-ranking former intelligence officials goes on national TV and testifies under oath to Congress about secret Pentagon UAP back engineering programs, files whistleblower complaints, followed by dozens of other whistleblowers claiming the same thing. You have a former Pentagon program director on the record about super secret legacy UAP programs. And Dr. Kirkpatrick doesn't bother to reach out to David Grush officially. <laughs> I mean, you, you just, you can't make this stuff up. It is pure incompetence or is it something else? Is Arrow, under Sean Kirkpatrick's leadership, intent on getting to the truth for both Congress and the American people? Can whistleblowers, Congress, and Americans trust Arrow and its leadership? Now, what I'm about to tell you is from a very high-ranking source, very high-ranking, that has given us um, information that has always, always panned out. This information is significant. And in my opinion, it demands a congressional investigation into Arrow. So, everyone pay attention. When Arrow was established, Ronald Moultrie also established an advisory council called Arrow Exec, or Arrow Executive Council, whose purpose was to provide oversight and guidance to Arrow and was headed by Ronald Moultrie himself. The existence of this advisory board or, uh, uh, it was, was actually it was nothing secret. Everybody knew about it on the Hill. Uh, Moultrie actually announced it in an official Pentagon memo that, that, was, that you can find on the Internet. So Congress knew, knew, of its, it knew of its existence and who sat on the council. There was nothing to hide. But there has been something hidden from Congress. And here it is. When Arrow was formed by Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, he assembled a separate secret council of advisors. A few people on Capitol Hill recently got wind of this and asked Kirkpatrick for the names of who was sitting on this secret council. Kirkpatrick refused to tell them. Why? I'll tell you why. Because some of these unelected officials who sit on this super secret advisory council are the actual gatekeepers of the legacy UAP crash recovery and back engineering program. I mean, seriously, talk about the fox guide, uh, guarding the hen house. You cannot make this shit up. And uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick, sorry to break it to you, but 
these officials on Capitol Hill now have the list of names that are sitting on your little secret council. Congress and congressional staffers, this is really huge. It calls into question, um, you know, what is going on at ERA? What is, who is, who is guiding it? And if you have one front-facing um, board that everyone knows about, but then you have something that's hidden from you and uh, kept under wraps, and then you have at least two people that are, uh, are gatekeepers to the legacy UAP uh, crash retrieval and back engineering program. I mean, come on. Uh, you guys have to, have to look into that. And, th and this also brings into, into question whether we can trust Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick and Arrow, whether whistleblowers can go to Arrow and, and trust them. Uh, it's 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 crazy. So, um, so with that said, uh, let's let's bring in our guest for today, who was entrusted with our nation's most powerful nuclear weapons, and whose experience with UAPs shutting down his nuclear missile squadron uh, or flight eventually led him <coughs> to testify to Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick at Arrow. Please welcome uh, United States Air Force Captain David Shindley. Uh, Captain, how are you, sir? Uh, very well. It's uh, good to be with you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. So uh, uh, I was a bit long-winded in in my explanation there of, of of what we found out, and I'm just curious what uh, what your reaction is uh, to this information that we got that uh, that there's a, a a secret council that uh, that Kirkpatrick put together that uh, comprises of uh, of uh, several people, two of which are. Uh, were or are gatekeepers to the legacy retrieval program. Does that surprise you? Well, it is shocking to hear that because I didn't realize that, you know, Kirkpatrick had uh, this group of people who was running, the, actually running the show. Uh, I had in the back of my mind all the time that uh, Kirkpatrick uh, was working for somebody that... Uh, uh, that was giving him directions, but uh, I had no idea that uh, these were the gatekeepers to all this back engineering and whatever. So, uh, yeah, it's it's surprising to me. I, yeah, I I was uh, I have to say I was pretty shocked when uh, when this info was shared. So, um, you know, you know, we have our, some viewers here that are not familiar with your, with your case. I think probably most people that have been tracking the UFO issue. Uh, UAP issue for quite some time are familiar with it. So tell us a little bit about your Air Force career and where you ended up in the Air Force and then your uh, event uh, relating to UAP. Well, after attending college, in uh, I graduated in 1963, and I knew I would be getting a, a draft notice. And so I applied for officer training school in the Air Force and I was accepted. Um, so when I finished officer training school, uh, I had previously requested that I be assigned to Fairchild Air Force Base uh, in Spokane, Washington, uh, where there was uh, Atlas missiles. Uh, there was uh, nine liquid fuel Atlas missiles, intercontinental continental ballistic missiles. Uh, and that's where I wanted to go. And sure enough, that's where they assigned me to go. So I was a launch control officer with the Atlas E missiles uh, for one year before they were uh, uh, downgraded and dismantled in favor of the Minuteman. And I left uh, Fairchild in uh, uh, June, late June of 1965. And then I was uh, assigned to Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota with the Minuteman missiles. So I had to go through uh, training all over again, this time with the Minuteman missile. And uh, after six months of training and a few mo more months uh, at Minot, uh, I became a, a launch control officer uh, with the Minuteman uh, with a commander over me uh, uh, named Major Gordon Tollerud. And uh, we had, see this was in January, 1966 that I got on the crew. And then in uh, uh, September 1966, um, it was uh, 
an interesting experience that I had. Uh, Gordon and I were uh, assigned to relieve a missile crew at November flight. This was, this was in September. Um, and normally we had crew changeover at all 15 of the uh, launch control centers around, surrounding Minot every morning. And uh, he and I were scheduled to go to the November flight and uh, which was about 35 miles away from the base. But pre pre before going there, uh, we went to the pre-departure crew briefing where all 15 missile crews would gather on the base and be briefed on the world events and uh, protocol and procedures and current status of the missiles. Well, during that briefing, we were told that several missiles at November flight had gone off alert, uh, but no other detail was, was mentioned. And so uh, after the briefings, several uh, 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 crews came up to Gordon Toller and I and says, did you hear the news uh, this morning? And I said, yes, I did. And my commander did too. And the news was that uh, residents of Mole Hall, North Dakota saw several uh, uh, UFOs overnight. And uh, it was west of town and they, there was bright flashing lights and so forth. So they, they figured it was UFOs for some reason. Anyway, uh, those uh, missileers that came up to Gordon Toller and I after the pre-departure briefing, uh, that was the news that they were talking about. So this was on our minds as we traveled by car to, to November flight. And we traveled through the town of Mohall, North Dakota. And this was on a Sunday morning. And uh, the, that town was absolutely dead. There nothing going on. Three miles west of town, we pulled into the launch control uh, facility topside. And uh, we got briefed by topside uh, people on what happened overnight. And it was absolutely unbelievable. Uh, but anyway, after uh, some discussion with topside people, we went down below 60 feet underground to where the launch control capsule was located. And we, uh, the bath store was open for us and we walked in and when Gordon Tallerud and I looked at the far end of the launch control capsule at the launch control console, uh, we saw that there were red lights all the way across the board, uh, indicating that all missiles, all missiles were off alert and they couldn't be launched. Uh, we went through uh, um, debriefing of that crew as to what they experienced overnight and what happened to the missiles and uh, each missile was queried. The missile could, each missile could talk to us when we pushed the query button. And the query, the uh, answer to the problem was uh, guidance and control system malfunction for each one of those missiles. Well, to make a long story short, the crew uh, uh, that we relieved left and uh, we were in charge of 10 missiles that we could, could not launch. And we had never seen anything like that before. Sometimes we'd go to relieve a crew and we'd find maybe one or two missiles off alert for maintenance of one thing or another. But normally all missiles were always on alert and uh, we never, like I said, we never saw anything like this before and just blew our minds. Um, the uh, previous crew had uh, called the wing combat post and, and, uh, and uh, also operations. And uh, there were uh, maintenance crews uh, heading out to, to the, each one of those missiles uh, uh, to try attempt to bring them back to alert. And there's many on people on base who, who knew about this. Uh, base commanders, um, the ma of course, all the maintenance people involved uh, in th their uh, that leadership there. Uh, the many uh, security people uh, were were sent out. So this was something that caught the attention of a lot of people who had who had responsibilities to bringing all this stuff missiles back to alert status and also trying to figure out what happened. Um, so that that's essentially the, the story of uh, 
my instant in, in a sharp capsule. Uh, that's the way it went. And and so and just for people that that don't understand uh, as far as how how our nuclear uh, ICBMs are controlled, two two launch officers in a in a capsule uh, <coughs> control ten individual intercontinental ballistic missiles. Correct. That's correct. And at my my not Air Force Base, we had fifteen launch control centers spread from northeast of the town, uh, counterclockwise to the uh, south uh, east of town. And those launch control centers, actually we call them launch control facilities. That was the name for the top ground facility, top side facility. Uh, they were all located, November I believe was the closest one, about 37 miles away. But the others were 70 miles and perhaps even more further away. Uh, and then each launch control center uh, controlled 10 man missiles. And these missiles were located, in my case, uh, as far as I know, they were four to 14 miles away from us. Uh, I don't think there were any missiles closer than four miles from the launch, uh, a launch control center. Normally, I was, my commander and I were assigned to Mike flight, but this time we're going to November flight to relieve the crew there. Uh, Yes, uh, the the capsule itself, the launch control capsule, was located underground, about sixty feet underground, and uh, it was called the LCC. And in in your experience as a launch control officer, Captain, you you had never encountered that volume of missiles going to, uh, entering a no go state, correct? No, like like I said, the most we had ever seen was two that were off alert, and. Uh, uh, like I said, I was there as the launch control officer from September to uh, January to September and uh, did about uh, 12 to 15 uh, tours a month to various launch control centers. And not, we had also three squadrons, uh, uh, five uh, launch control facilities uh, managed by each squadron. Uh, my squadron, the 742nd, had the uh, Kilo, Lima, Mike, and November flights. And uh, that's the way it worked. Now, what, what, was, what was the first thing that went through your head? What, what did you think to yourself when you were told that, that UFOs had managed to disable these nuclear missiles? Well, we discussed that uh, with the uh, outgoing crew uh, after we arrived, and... Uh, uh, it was a real mystery to us. We, we couldn't understand it. According to Topside, this object hovered over uh, or behind the main gate of the Topside facility. And they were on the phone to, to the crew down below. And uh, they watched this thing sitting there for quite some time. And then uh, uh, pretty soon the... Uh, object uh, uh, took off and in a second or two it was gone uh, just hit went straight up um, and the the missile crew said that as the when the thing was hovering just behind the main gate and they were talking with the top side uh, crew uh, people the security guards uh, um, all the all the lights on the control console uh, went red, just one after the other, right across the board. Wow. Uh, we we discussed whether it was some kind of an EMF pulse, the uh, electromotive force pulse, uh, or, or or something like that, but we couldn't understand how that pulse, uh, electrical uh, um, shock, could it incorporate a signal to essentially take the guidance and control system of each missile off alert. Uh, you know, we discussed it, but we, we, it was just un unbelievable. We, we couldn't uh, make sense of it. Now, prior, prior to this event occurring, had you heard of this happening with any other, uh, any other squadrons? No, no. In fact, uh, 
um, that's that's what has has surprised me in in hindsight. Uh, um, you know, after we uh, got to base, well, we we were told never to talk about this again. And, and after we got the base, uh, uh, we were we were wondering, uh, is there anybody else, in, any other crews involved with this, this kind of experience? And uh, uh, it was a mystery to us because if we're told to keep quiet, other people told to keep quiet also. But it occurred to us that this must have happened many times before because we were only told to keep quiet. Nobody asked us any questions about what happened. Wow. Uh, Nothing. We, we were we were not. Nobody had told other crews about this. We were never trained on what to do if this should happen again. And we figured, well, we're not getting any questions here. We expected to be sat down and questioned for maybe hours as to what had happened, but none of that. So, Unbelievable. you know, it must have happened again, and they knew what this was all about, and they didn't want to talk to us. Now, did they did they ask you to sign a non-disclosure agreement? They had the crew that re relieved sign an agreement, and that commander, as far as I know, is alive today. At least I saw him several years ago at a, at a missile air reunion. Uh, he had told me at that reunion, he says, Dave, you got to understand that when I returned to base, I was I was required, ordered to sign this non-disclosure agreement in writing. And uh, he says, uh, he essentially told me then, he says, I, I just want you to know that I can't talk to you. And I, I don't ever ask me any questions about this again. And in fact, uh, a couple reunions later, I gave him a copy of, of my book that I wrote on this incident. And I says, you know, the description of this, of that incident is in my book. And uh, he took my book and uh, he never sh has never showed up at, a, at another reunion again. I haven't seen him since. And we've had three consecutive reunions since then. So now. And who was it that told you, or, or um, not the name in particular, but uh, maybe who, what rank this person was or their function on the base, who exactly said to you, do not talk about this again? Uh, when we uh, rel were relieved by another crew and my commander and I uh, went topside, I attempted to question the flight security controller topside who was uh, involved with that incident or saw the, the actual incident, I, I attempted to question him again. He said, I'm sorry, sir, but I've directed not to talk about this subject to get ever again. And then, then my commander told me, he says, oh, I forgot to tell you, uh, when you're on rest break below ground, I got a call from the Office of Special Investigations, the Air Force Office of Special Investigation. And he, he said he was told that we we're never supposed to, to talk about this again, and was told, as far as you concerned, or con are concerned, it never happened. Wow! Which is the name, which is the name of my book. It never happened, um, and uh, I thought, oh my God, you know. And then uh, I was I was a little shocked about that, and uh, it, it's true. We never they, we were told. We're never, never even to talk to each other about this again, which blew my mind. And and I, I remember to this day on Octo October 12th, 1966, we had a plane go down in the area of our missile flight and we directed the security guards to go out and try to find this, this plane. And I mentioned at the time to my commander, I says, I wonder if a UFO had something to do with this. And then all of a sudden, I thought, uh oh, I violated my oh. agreement. Uh, anyway. Wow. So, so after this thing, you couldn't even talk to your wife about this. Oh, no, no. And uh, I wasn't required to sign a, 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 a NDA, but I did essentially agree to the verbal NDA. I mean,
I mean, that's, and that's what it was from my commander. Uh, but no, when I got home, I didn't tell my wife. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't speak to anybody about it. Uh, I had no idea that this stuff was happening around the missile field. Uh, but it really was because I found out in rate later reunions, uh, and, and talk to people uh, that, you know, this stuff was going on. Um, I did find, see an article in the Minot Daily News on December 6th, 1966, and it had headlines uh, on the paper. And um, it said, uh, uh, it said, Minot Launch Control Center saucer cited oh, cited, this cited as one indication of outer space visitors. This is in the Minot Daily News on wow. that day. Uh -huh. And and evidently the Minot Daily News got a heads up on a Saturday evening post article that was to be published on December 17th, 1966, which was written by Alan Heinick. Well, Anik, Alan Heinick had paid a visit to Minot in late October or early November to look into some other instance that had happened. There was an incident that happened, I found out that happened, it's in Blue Book Files, that happened on uh, August 25th, 1966. And this in, involved another crew commander from my squadron named Val Smith and his incident occurred at Mike flight. And uh, evidently Hynek heard about this incident when he came to Minot to interview with Al Smith. Although I don't know if he ever did interview him to tell the truth. But also regarding that incident, uh, evidently uh, people on Minot Air Force Base investigated it because Chester Shaw, Major Chester Shaw of Minot Air Force Base sent a uh, note to Blue Book, which was directed by Air Force Regulation 200-2, that that on the sighting or this uh, incident that happened at Mike Flight uh, on that day with uh, Val Smith. So I got I got hints on December 6th with that Minot news article that something was happening in the missile field, but nobody was talking. There were there people, people were quite asking each other, did, did you see the news this morning, the, the headlines this morning? And, yeah, but nobody was talking nobody about was it. Talking. I mean, nobody, nobody knew anything about it. Uh, Val Smith certainly didn't speak up. Anyway. Did, so, and, and you mentioned uh, going to these, these sort of uh, reunion, reunion uh, uh, sort of class reunions, I guess, or a, a reunion of other missileers. When you begin, when you went uh, after you went public with this, and when you went to these reunions, did other people approach you and say, "Oh, by the way, this happened when I was on duty," or did you hear similar stories? Other, and of course, many of us are, are familiar with uh, Robert or Captain uh, Bob Salas's uh, incident. I, uh, did you hear of any yes. others? Well, uh, interestingly. Uh, I didn't hear about these reunions until 2010, and I got a call from a missileer uh, from the 740th Squadron uh, from when I was there, and I was surprised to get this call. And he says, "Oh, uh, I'm I'm calling to invite you to a reunion we're having." Evidently, they had just found out my name and phone number and somehow and called me, and I said, "No, I'm not. I'm not really interested. I I wouldn't know anybody now." And, uh, I just wasn't interested. But then uh, later on the next year in 2011, he, I got another call from him. He says, are you sure you don't want to come to the arena? We're having lots of fun and it'd be, it'd be good to see you. And I said, no, no thanks. But he gave me his email address. And so I emailed him. I said, by the way, I hate to ask you, but do you recall anything about any UFO instance in Minot when you were there? And I couldn't believe it with the reply that I received from him. He had an incident himself and he described it. And he was, he was talking about missiles going down. So uh, he also clued me on to another missile air, uh, Larry Manross. 
uh, and uh, so I, I contacted him and found out about his incident. And then later on, I, I found out about a whole slew of other incidents, in, in, including incidents where, well, where there was outer security alarms that some of the missiles were, security guards were sent out and saw these objects hovering over the, uh, the silos. And uh, I thought, oh my goodness, you know, things that we didn't know when we were there. Amazing that they that they kept that uh, they uh, they kept that uh, locked down so so tightly even to the point where you weren't allowed to discuss it with with your fellow airmen that all had the same secret security clearance. It, it's just insane. Now, so so let's let's fast forward to present day and uh, talk about your testimony to Arrow. For, uh, firstly, how did you get? connected to, uh, to Arrow, if that's something you can speak about? Uh, well, I was warned in an email uh, telling me that uh, that all this uh, email stuff between us is confidential. Uh, it's, it said, uh, as you probably know, all records created by Arrow our formal government records, including these email exchanges, are subject to the laws, directives, and so forth. Um, but I was contacted by email, and uh, just a moment here. No problem. Uh oh. Okay. I uh, was losing. Lost your, f I still hear I, you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, lo I just lost your, your photo there. Or, I'm sorry, your video. Well, something happened to my screen here. Okay. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Did you click on uh, Skype again? I'm sorry. That's okay. If for some reason we can't get the picture back, uh, I'll put my my uh, my shot up full screen so everybody can uh, uh, stare at me while while you uh, while you talk about this. There we go. Now we got you back. Okay. All right. Cool. Oh, sorry, Bob. All okay. Good. I got an I got an email, Romero, and uh, I was really I was wondering if this email was a hoax. Frankly, I, I just <laughs> I. I just didn't understand it. Okay. It started off. It started off by saying, uh, um, "This is an opportunity to incorporate into the official records discrete knowledge and experiences of those exposed to the U.S. government's previous unidentified anomalous phenomena investigations." I started huh. thinking, I wasn't involved in any kind of investigation since. It, it said, uh, uh, several other places, like, uh, the purpose of the interview is, is to gather into historical information you may, have, you may have regarding sensitive government programs. Well, I haven't been involved in any sensitive government programs. Wow. Uh, so, uh, it was confusing. And uh, well, uh, and it's, it sorry. said it would be. It also said the interview would be held in a secure. Geez, <laughs> this is, this stuff is. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. I, yeah, yeah, it's all good. Okay, I'll be wrapped up in. <laughs> the, joy, the joys of, wire, of, of wireless. Uh, yeah, the, I, I'm sure somebody's going to make some fun. Okay, I, I need glasses to read this. Yeah, that's all good. And uh, it says these investigations will be held in a secure environment, and uh, everything you say and do, uh, say and describe will will uh, be held uh, in, accordingly in, in secret. So. Uh, um, so he, he the, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. So, so it was very, very confusing. So, you know? so you get this email from Arrow, and, I, 
So I actually Elon, Elon back, email them back and say, is this a hoax or what, what's going on here? I, what's, what's with these, uh, uh, the stuff, uh, um, I, you know, <laughs> unbelievable. I'm not involved in any government agencies investigating in UFOs. So, so why, what's with this email? Well, I, I called Salas and, and another one who had been interviewed and said, did you get an invitation? For, what, what did it say? Well, come to find out, it was the very same form letter that I got. Wow. I didn't realize it's a form letter. And it was screwy, I tell you. So, so do me a favor, because I think this is really significant. Read that email one last time, if you would, please. Uh, the interview will, will be held discreetly in a secure location. Arrow was deemed by the classification control office of both the DOD, ODNI, as an authorized disclosure. The purpose of the interview is to gather historical information you may have regarding sensitive government programs and any potential nexus. What the heck is that? Please let us know whether you have any interest in participating in the secure, protected, and historical interview. They asked if I had any interest rather than saying they would highly appreciate my participation. But I, which, yeah, it's crazy. Well, and the, and the thing that's so Arrow is sending out a form letter to apparently they think they're sending it to people that were part of covert UAP programs. And they're saying, come on in and let's talk about those programs. Perhaps. I, I, I don't mean, know. I, I kind of to me, that's it. It, it sounds yeah. like it sounds like. It was yeah. addressed to people that were involved in legacy UAP programs. They're saying it in that an email. Was, that's what I thought. Yeah, you're sending this to the wrong person, you know. And I even, I even, in my second email to them, they after they said, "Yeah, it's legitimate." I says, well, "What's this about? You know, uh, investigations and and." Uh, sensitive government programs. Uh, <laughs> they didn't answer me. I, 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 yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. I, I am I am frankly speechless. Uh, A, that they're, they're um, you know, communicate com, sec, uh, com security is so loose that they would send an email out, uh, an email blast, to a bunch of people that they thought were part of secret government UAP programs that obviously you were never involved with and none of these other folks were. And right. they sent they send something like that out. I mean, to me, that's just pure, um, you know, that's Keystone Cops. That's just completely yeah. incompetent. And it also flies. I talked, to Sal, I, I talked to Salas about this and yeah, sure enough, it's word for word what, what he had received. Yeah, I mean, that seriously flies in the face of national security. And so I agreed to participate. Okay. But then, the, then they sent me uh, another email and said, well, would 2 p.m. on May 9th, uh, Eastern Standard Time, be okay with you? And so I, I re emailed them back. I said, are you sure you mean Eastern Standard Time for May 9th? It, no, they meant daylight time. And so I questioned them about that. And they said, 2 p.m. it is. <laughs> they didn't answer your question. No. And on, on this email, and I take it you still have copies of these emails. That's right. Uh, were any other people CC'd on there, or were you the only recipient? No, I was the only one. Okay, okay. And, um, yeah, I'm still, still trying to digest <laughs> this. This is crazy. Um, I don't know how somebody could hold uh, a security clearance if they're sending out emails acknowledging the, uh, the existence of uh, legacy programs and one asking people to, to so, come in and talk about it over non-secure so, communication means. And then I have some thoughts that I wrote down regarding that too at the time. I said, 
why would they send a form letter rather than a personalized invitation right asking me to to participate whether asking me if i was interested and i i note here arrow does not seem to react in a professional manner and their true intent in all this is to put to put arrow under suspicion they would have been expected that there would have been face-to-face -face contact on such an important matter with a strong effort to get participation in order to arrive at the truth. Um, and also... You, you've got your, this, uh, your your thing on there. <laughs> <laughs> That's all yeah. good. Hey, we're here to have fun. In, in addition to talking about UAP this stuff. This is a first-time experience, and look what's happening. I, I think you're doing great. Uh, and then to top it off, uh, there was another email with a phone number to call. Okay. And so I had I had to call them, and that began the interview. It was not a secure location. It was o over open phone lines. Uh, After promising them this invitation that everything would be absolutely secure, they violated my NDA. So, yeah, I was about to say. So had you had you? I mean, obviously you agreed to a, a verbal NDA, but had you signed a written NDA? you and speaking to Arrow over a non-secure communications link would have been a abject violation of a national oh, national security non-disclosure agreement. Definitely. And, I, you know, I, I've hesitated all along about talking with people in government about this. And uh, I always thought, well, you know, it'd be either face-to-face -face or uh, somehow made more secure than... than you and I talking about this. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, how careless is that? Uh, I mean, that's just, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, people, and, and this is why people don't want to talk. They, they, and we'll get into that in a little bit, because I, I can give you some specific reasons why whistleblowers are bypassing Arrow, and I think this is part and parcel of, of, of how they're running or how Dr. Kirkpatrick is running this organization. I mean, it, it feels very slap shot, uh, if, you, well, if you ask I, I me. Can, I can tell you that other people that have been interviewed have this, the same uh, situation with me and are, are really not too pleased with it, with Arrow. So, okay, so let, let's jump into your call uh, with, with Arrow. So uh, you call 1-800-LET'S-TALK-UFOs. Uh, uh, who picks up the phone? Who's on the call? And walk us through how that, how that went, if you don't mind. Um, yes, I, <clears throat> I gave them the call, and uh, they, they had several people gathered there. Uh, and they told me who they were, and uh, I started out with them by asking them some questions. I asked them, are you recording this interview? And they said, well, we're transcribing it. And I said, what does that mean? Right, yeah. And they, they, said, they said, they're taking handwritten notes. <laughs> That's a common thread I've heard before. They said, I said, can you tell me about how you happen to be talking with me? And they said, they're given my name. Uh, what will you do with the information I pass on to you? Well, they're going to create a memorandum for file uh, re regarding what we talked about, of course, via their handwritten notes. Um, you know, all the time, you know, South and I thought they were recording this stuff. Yeah. Uh, but they obviously weren't. Uh, how many people with work with Arrow at this time? I believe they told me, but I don't recall what that was. Uh, do any people in Arrow have UFO, a, UAP background prior to to Arrow, joining Arrow? And the question, the answer was no. Are any people familiar? <laughs> Seriously? Are any people? In, yeah. Any people in Arrow familiar with the long history of UAP UFO situation in this uh, country? Well, they weren't familiar with any investigation whatsoever. And I says, well, are you, are you familiar with uh, the Air Force projects, Project Sign, Project Grudge, Project Blue Book? No. Uh, <laughs> are any of you familiar with my book? 
And and the answer was yes. Okay. Uh, and then I said, I would like to ask you one final question. Are you familiar with, familiar with the name Admiral Roscoe Hillencotter? Well, this is the former original CIA director in 1947 who was uh, brought to office on, uh, I believe, uh, September 18th, 1947, which is the same day that the Air Force uh, was separated from the uh, Army Air Force, the Army. Um, and so then I went a little further talking about what uh, Hill and Cotter wrote to the New York, New York Times on February 28th, 1960. Let me read that to you, that, that short blurb that uh, from Hill and Cotter, in part. It is time for truth to be, brought, to be brought out in open congressional hearings. Behind the scenes, high-ranking Air Force officers are soberly concerned about the UFOs. But through official secrecy and ridicule, many citizens are led to believe the unknown flying objects are nonsense. To hide the facts, the Air Force has silenced its personnel. This was in the February 28th, 1960 issue of the uh, New York Times. Six years after that, I found myself being silenced by the Air Force. And I, you know, it's unbelievable. Now, uh, if I may ask, was uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick on that call with you? The top official Vero was on the call. And uh, so how would you characterize uh, your interaction with this top official? It was pleasant most of the time. But I, I, I told him I had watched his presentation to Congress April 19th, um, 2023. And in that, he talked about using the scientific method in, in investigating UFOs, looking at UFOs. And I essentially told him, someone who's got a doctorate degree in physics, I told him, you're never gonna be able to use today's science and the scientific method to diagnose these UFOs. And I was pretty blunt with him. And then he started to rebut me. And we started <laughs> talking. He started talking. I says, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Because uh, he knew what I was talking about. He knew today's science is way uh, below the technology and uh, these things that, that are flying around the skies. And make in hovering over missile, uh, ICBM missile fields. Do you think that they were, were, did you get the sense that they were familiar with these nuclear cases or was this like literally news to their ears? Oh, I think they heard of them before. Okay. Yes. In, in, in fact, when they wrote up the MFR, they only included my opening statement which I sent to them. What's an MFR? I, a memorandum for record. Okay. I asked them, you know, how are you gonna document this? Well, it's gonna be a memorandum for record. And the only thing they included in that was my opening statement, um, and uh, which is right here. And it's several pages long. Uh, but they did not include any dialogue, none of the questions that I asked, none of the information I provided them regarding what happened at Minot, nothing about Hynek, Hynek visiting our base and, and, uh, and staying at uh, Colonel Lemansky's home on base. Um, I had a lot of information from other missileers that had, that at least five other missileers that had uh, uh, information. And uh, 
they 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 just seemed disinterested. In fact, uh, an email I got from them uh, said that they were only interested interested in docu documenting my uh, visual inspection of the launch control console where all ten missiles were off alert. That's the only interest in there interest, interested in me in saying. And, and that that blew my mind. And this was after the fact, after I, I rejected their MFR because it was incomplete. And so you rejected the MFR. Did they reply to that rejection? Uh, yes, in, in about a three-page letter. Really? And, what did, uh, okay. And uh, they explained to me that uh, that <clears throat> they're you know, concentrating on doing a good job and making these interviews and, and they're really working hard and they're they're essentially suffering that that they are volunteers, that they have to uh, um, uh, leave family and friends and, and to 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 do their work. And I, I you know, I sent them actually I, I wrote an email to them which I I decided I wouldn't send. Okay, because <laughs> it was a little bit, little bit blistering. I said, you know, essentially, I, 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 was, I was saying, well, we in the Air Force suffered also, and uh, especially holding back uh, a monumental secret important to all of humankind. And uh, I, I said it has been a burden on us also to keep that secret from the American people. And uh, uh, in fact, it, it gets me a little bit emotional when, when I think about it. In what and, way? Uh, well, I spent 40 years holding the secret back. And uh, I mean, it was really helpful for Salas to come out and talk about his, his identical experience to mine. And it was a great relief for me. But then the uh, aspect of uh, the U.S. government or somebody in the U.S. government holding this information back from American people and American leaders uh, really is quite disturbing and, and, and upsetting to me. I, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, uh, you go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's, that's a huge weight. And um, I, I think what is really disappointing in Arrow and how they treated you is just the, the is kind of the flippance of the whole thing. Uh, a, a, not uh, putting you in a proper environment to talk about this stuff, proper secure environment, uh, even if you, if you didn't sign a, a national non-disclosure agreement. And, and, and actually, one, qu one question I meant to ask earlier, how long did this telephone call, this telephone interview last? Uh, not too long, less, less than a half an hour. Okay, but you know, that's, that's still a, a pretty good amount of time. So yeah. they, they, interview, they interview, interview you for half an hour. But some of that, some of that time was taken with my opening statement. Of course. Some of that time was uh, talking about the scientific method some of that time was on my final statement to them. So they asked essentially two questions. The first one was, what was the name of the OSI agent that called you commander? Well, I didn't know, I have no idea. And I, I don't know if the name was even given to him. Um, the second question was, how did you know it was at a UFO? that caused the problem. <laughs> so I went through my story of, of my pre-departure crew briefing and the news that had been on that morning. But then I told them of what the top side crew told me. And uh, the, the top side crew was pretty emotional about this thing. And they were, they had been very frightened about this incident. Normally, my crew, crew commander and I, uh, the procedure when we got to the launch control facility topside, 
the com my commander would go into the security section of the building through the through the door to the security section. I'd go through. I would inspect the topside facility in the grounds, and then go in the back door. Well, <clears throat> when I went through the back door, the site manager, a tech sergeant, greeted me, and he said, "Did you hear, hear the news overnight? What happened overnight?" I said, "No," and he said, "Well, follow me." And he took me to the day room to the west facing windows of the day room and he proceeded to put his hands out in, uh, out in front of him and, and talking about this object that was sitting maybe 100 feet away just outside the, the fence to the facility. And uh, it was night, but this object had bright flashing lights and, and uh, um, I, I asked, well, was it a helicopter? Well, I knew helicopters didn't fly at night. And and he said, no. And he said, there was no sign of helicopters or anything. Uh, but he couldn't adequately express what the lights looked like. They were not like beacon lights from airplanes. Uh, uh, they were just flashing bright lights, he said. And... Uh, and but uh, he couldn't adequately explain exactly what it meant what he meant by that whether they pulsating or what whatever um anyway the uh he said the uh, the object stayed there hovered there for quite some time and then it started moving off to the right to the north to the uh and settled hovered just behind the main gate of the facility and and he said it stayed there for quite some time. And uh, at that time, it was, it, was a, it was a place where the security people could, could see the object. And uh, you, you could tell by the expression on their faces and, and the tone of their voices that this was very disturbing. And the, uh, they were frightened, frankly. Um, and so I, I told uh, uh, Arrow that, that story. And... Uh, no questions. No, no follow up. No, who no were these up. people? Um, who was the base commander? I, I mean, just kind of like they base... didn't ask who the who the commander was that had experienced the situation overnight. <laughs> you know, I thought that would be the first question they would ask. Yeah, and I know his name. I haven't really divulged it to any people. But... It's 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 truly Keystone Cops. I mean, I, you know. I, I could uh, I could probably do a better and or ask more intelligent questions than I than I th think they did. So did you get the impression that it was just a general disinterest on uh, Arrow's part and this uh, senior official of uh, Arrow, <coughs> Kirkpatrick, um, that uh, uh, wasn't interested in this? Yeah, I'm trying to find my well, what, how uh, the information on my rejection. Here's here's what they sent me, the, the MF, MFR. Uh, and, Sorry, hold, hold, and, that up, hold that up one more time. I, I didn't have your, uh, your camera selected. A little bit higher. Okay. Under Secretary of Defense, witness interview arrow. Okay. And, you know, I signed it, but I didn't transmit it back to them. Uh, with the MFR, I, I stated the following. Yes, from my perspective, I am disappointed that your interview with me took place in an atmosphere of disinterest, which the MFR reflected. Since I expected more than a repeat of my initial opening statement in the MFR, please update your MFR for me and send it back, and I will be very willing to sign it if it appears comprehensive and complete with the information we discussed. It is important to the American public that the information received by you from com a com competent former military be recorded and noted properly. You have the cap capability and authoriza authorization to do that unless you have been directed otherwise. And no, no response to that from them. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry. You said there, there was a, there was a there was a response, and which I wrote a response back to them, which I didn't send. 
And toward the end of the month of May, then I received another email from a specific person arrow who gave his name, first name, and it was another couple page memo. And uh, it was uh, it was disappointing to read, frankly. And uh, I, I decided, you know, heck with him. I'm not going to have anything more to do with Arrow. And I haven't. I, I, I don't blame you. I mean, you know, what's really amazing is you spent 30 minutes. It wasn't like you were on a, a two hour phone call. You spent 30 minutes uh, on the phone uh, with Arrow, and uh, we'll just, uh, I'll, I will assume, the director of Arrow, Sean Kirkpatrick, and there, uh, there's, there's no court reporter, there's no recording, they're taking handwritten notes, and, um, and I guess their well, note, note-taking skills aren't what, really good. <laughs> all, all the interviewees, I'm sure, expected uh, their voice to be recorded on all this. Sure. But... Evidently not. Yeah. Well, and you know, and here, here's the thing. So Arrow, Arrow is mandated, legally mandated to provide Congress with a classified briefing of uh, at, uh, at classified reports over certain periods, and um, they were only interested in creating their MFR and filing it away. The MFR that I received from them had all names redacted in place of the names were a file number. And on the last page of the MFR, those last names were listed with according with the uh, according with the numbers listed. But they also said the MFR would be filed without the last page. Well, that MFR with my opening statement, it would have been ridiculous to file that away without my name on it. That's crazy. That's something I wrote and gave that to them. Not only that, but what I gave them to, to, to them was something I gave to a couple other people before I had the interview with, with uh, Arrow. And so uh, what, they, what I gave them, a couple of people already had and since then, I've given out more couple of copies, and those names on those copies that I provided were not redacted. <laughs> now, and now, you you had mentioned that that you've spoken to other people that have testified to Arrow, and they had similar experiences. What can you tell us about that? Um, I already told you about Robert Salas, right? Were there any others uh, besides him? There was also one other missile air that, that uh, not a missile air, but a security guard. Yes, a security guard that had been interviewed. And uh, I asked him what he felt about the interview and he, he said he was not happy. And uh, that, that the experience this guy had was just unbelievable, really something else. I mean, he had direct direct um, contact with the UFO. Um, yeah, I'm not going to reveal his name. But. Of course, un un understood. But he, he, was, he was sort of, uh, but he was treated in the same sort of, uh, oh, uh, last, go ahead. Evidently, we didn't dis discuss at length, you know, just how he was treated or anything, but he just simply indicated to me that he was not pleased with the interview at all. So, yeah, uh, yeah I'm just frankly, uh, <laughs> it's kind of not surprised, not surprised. Um, so, do you think that other whistleblowers, if if you do consider yourself a whistleblower, do you think that they should con that they should uh, go to Arrow? What if if I were if I were to say, if I met you and over lunch and and let's say I was uh, I had a similar experience and I said uh, uh, Captain you know, do you think I should uh, you know I had this happen do you think I it's worth my time to go talk to them what would your advice be There'd be no way that I would advise them to to, to contact Earl. There's no way you know I was suspicious with the invitation email I got and. Uh, 
ever ever since my interview with them, I, I was I've been thinking, oh, these guys are only doing just only what they need to do if, to get by. Uh, they weren't interested in, in creating a, a complete MFR or any dialogue and any anything you know uh, regarding my experience. Uh, like they they said in in their in one response to me, they're only interested in the ten missiles off alert that I saw on the on the launch control console. Well, what kind of an answer is that? You know, uh, th aren't you interested in anything else regarding that incident or? Right. Or and, what what was going on in the missile field uh, uh, the years after I left that I found out about? Uh, they didn't care. It's crazy. Crazy. They didn't obviously didn't care. They weren't interested in even talking to me because they they, they only asked an invitation only if I was interested. They didn't say they didn't say that they were they were, you know, really like me to participate in this thing. And I, I and I think the thing to keep in mind here, obviously. This is this experience is not uncommon. So how is how is Congress, the people that are that pass that legislate pass laws in this country, how are they able to make an educated decision when I think it would be a fair conclusion that what is being provided to them by arrow is not complete? If they can't bother themselves oh. to take a, a, a complete deposition of what occurred where the meat of it of what you said is important I, you know how, how can they do their jobs well, I, I have thought from the beginning there's people above arrow that are controlling arrow I mean he's got people and directors telling him what to do and evidently there's a war going on topside um, between some people in the defense department and in Congress, but I also know there's people in the Defense Department who really want this stuff to come out, and I, I think the war is really there. Yeah, I I, I would say so. And um, yeah, I was uh, speaking to someone on Capitol Hill uh, not too long ago, and we were talking about whistleblowers approaching Arrow, and I I think if you if you just kind of step back and look at it from the lens of, of someone like yourself, and let's say someone that was involved in some kind of legacy program, um, I, would, I would be very, very hesitant uh, to go to them. And we, we already saw the, the flippant nature of, of, of uh, not respecting your nondisclosure, your verbal nondisclosure agreement. Uh, you know, so you have to think if you're a whistleblower, especially somebody that was involved in a legacy program, you're going to go to Arrow, talk to people that you have no idea if they're on your side. You have no idea what investigative tools Arrow has at their disposal. So let's here's a good example. Let's say that. Uh, you are you work uh, for the Department of Energy or um, or a contractor for a DOE, and you discover an illegal op uh, operation that's being run out of DOE. Arrow does not have Title 18 authority to send a special agent into DOE, DOE to investigate. DOE, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, answers directly to the president. So. For instance, Arrow has AFOSI agents that are on their payroll. They have a couple of them. Those guys can't go to DOE as special agents. They can't go to DOE and talk to them about that unless there was some kind of joint Air Force uh, uh, DOE program. Um, it, it, you know that that's that's the thing. So if if you are if you know if you're a whistleblower and you're going to go and Put your ass on the line, uh, pardon my French, to discuss this, and you have no idea what Arrow can even do about it. Then, and and you're putting yourself, you're putting your name out there, you're putting out what you know. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it blows my mind that this thing is set up uh, the way that it is, and especially with what we 
and you really touched uh, touched on what we what we revealed earlier about this uh, secret um, advisory council that has a couple of legacy gatekeeper uh, gatekeepers on it. You know, Matt, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's been my feeling all along. I don't want to talk to anybody in defense about my experience. I really don't. I don't want to talk to anybody, but I will talk to Congress. And and that's, you know, that has been my message uh, for many years now is that, hey, I'm really, really reluctant to talk to the Department of Defense. After all, that's the, that's the authority for my NDA, uh, what's behind the NDA. Um, I'll talk to the civilian component, component of our leadership to make sure that they know and understand what's going on. And, and I, <clears throat> I, you know, I know that, uh, that are, there are definitely uh, congressional staffers that watch our show. And what I would say to anyone on Capitol Hill that is, is, um, is, watch, that is watching us right now uh, or will watch us later is, is to watch this from the beginning, what we had to say, but more importantly, listen uh, to what uh, Captain uh, Shinley uh, had to say. Um, you know, your bosses, your your congressmen, your senators cannot make informed decisions. You cannot give them uh, proper advice unless you are being told the whole story. And I think what's clear is Dr. Shankar Patrick, under his leadership, is is failing to do so. And you know, just like. Anything, everything is a, a small world. You know, you think government is a is a uh, a big thing, which it is, but there's always that six degrees of separation. People talk, and people hear about your story. Certainly, a lot of people um, have uh, have have shared with you similar experiences, and um, yeah, I mean, it's really it's really a travesty. I don't know if you even want to call it a honeypot, but uh, I think uh, anybody that is a whistleblower should just go directly to their representative. It does fall under protected disclosure. And um, yeah, and, and, and more importantly, uh, Captain, thank you for your service. Thank you for telling your story. Thank you for going through uh, what you did uh, with Arrow. I think it's, it's really sad and disrespectful uh, in your, to, your, to you and your service uh, to your country. If, if you have uh, a few minutes here, I'd like to uh, ask you, we have some, uh, some listener questions that uh, would love to run by you if, if you got a, a bit more sure. time. Okay, cool. Be fine. All right, awesome, <clears throat> thank you. Um, let's see, uh, Alfredo Nila, greetings from Chile. Thanks a lot uh, to open this truth about uh, UFOs. Um, and I, I think that's the main thing. People really understand your bravery a, respect your service to this country, and then also your bravery in, in, in coming forward and continuing to, um, you know, to, to carry this torch like uh, Bob Salas and Robert Hastings and others uh, to not let this thing die on the vine. Okay, uh, Lucas Oliveira, David, have you uh, tried to contact any congressman directly to give your testimony? Yes, I made uh, one in attempt to uh, contact Congressman uh, or Senator Gilbrand uh, via her website. But I understood at the time that uh, my message uh, would, would be received by staffers, but uh, I actually received no reply and I, I understand that. Um, but I can also see by this that it's, it's very difficult for the ordinary person to get a hold of a congressman or senator or whatever. Um, and no, I really haven't uh, been able to make a contact myself. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that offline. I can uh, make that uh, connection for you. Uh, okay, Gandaw, thank you for your service and your courage, good sir. That's, uh, uh, thank you for that. Uh, Spindub uh, Tracks, uh, firstly, thank you, Spindub, for 
the uh, nice uh, $10 Super Chat donation. That's, uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, Spin Dub Track says, thank you for your service and courage. Coming forward, David, uh, do you think Arrow's cagey behavior is due more to external pressure from DOD IC exec branch leadership, or is Arrow itself part of the cover-up? That's a really great question. Well, who, who knows what the personal feelings are of these people in Arrow? You know, I don't know. They're, they're doing their job, and uh, they're doing it according to what people tell them. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard to put blame uh, on Arrow, uh, I think. Um, they're nice people, but uh, they're not people I want to talk to again. Yeah, well, you know, and, and the thing, I, I think also, too, and I'm sure there's some really great people at Arrow, uh, but an organization is only as good as its leader, and everything flows downhill. If you have a great leader, you're going to encourage uh, the people below you to do their best work. When you have a leader um, that, uh, you know, face it, can't even get a damn website up, um, yeah. Okay, uh, Brett, uh, thank you for the Super Chat donation. Damn it, David, what are these things? What is your <laughs> what is your personal opinion on that? What are these, UFOs? Yeah, I think that's... Yeah, that's hell, I, I have no idea. I've never seen one. I'd sure like to see one. Um, but there's been plenty of people who've seen this stuff. And I've done a, a heck of a lot of research. And I have some of that in my book. But if... Uh, you really get into uh, researching Blue Book and find out all the people that were involved with that and who were involved with that object that crashed. I would say uh, um, it, it's, and then, then you look at all these other uh, experiences and descriptions. Frankly, you know, I've had to have an open mind on this stuff, I learned. Uh, I quickly learned that after attending the McMinnville UFO Festival in Oregon. Uh, this was several years ago. And I did give a presentation, the one and only presentation I've give, given in public. And uh, after the presentation, uh, one person, well, several people came up to me, but the one person in particular started, you know, congratulated me for coming out. And then, uh, talked about the incident he had. So I asked, uh, who are you? Who are you? What, what's your name? He wouldn't tell me. Wow. And uh, I found out I found out later that he was a U.S. Marshal. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then later on at that festival, we had to sit down, get together with, with some people. And there's this one couple was uh, looking at me and then uh, the wife came and talked to my wife and said my husband essentially said my husband would like to talk to your husband well I said I talked to him and come to find out he had been a he said he had been abducted when he was eight years old and he's had a couple of other experiences since then in his adult life and this guy had several master's degrees. Um, um, he he was well put together. He, <laughs> I was amazed at this guy, uh, uh, the intellect that he had, and uh, I learned right then that that I needed to keep an open mind to some of this stuff. And since then, four other contactees have approached me just out of the blue. You know, I thought. Oh my God, you know, this stuff must be real. I, yeah. But it's, yeah, you know, it's, I can understand that the average person just doesn't understand unless they've had an experience. Right. I mean, I've always, uh, I've always known it was real, but when I actually started seeing stuff uh, uh, myself, that's, it's a totally different thing at that point. But then why do some of these people like the Deputy Secretary of Defense come out and, and talk about this stuff and other people? So, you know, there's something to this. Oh, there are 100%, 100% is. Sorry, I wish I knew. Yeah. I knew for, wish I knew for sure. But I had the experience that of a lifetime and talked to people topside who, who saw this thing. And, I, you know, how can you disbelieve? 
Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. Okay, from uh, Nick M. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, from uh, uh, Flotilla. Does uh, Arrow uh, take anyone in a skiff? I don't know. I'm not sure. We. we I don't. Use... I don't think so. I sincerely doubt it. Although they have these form letters that say that that's true. Probably take you to a McDonald's and debrief you or a Denny's, uh, yeah. most likely. Heck have I know. Uh, Katkin, uh, uh, sorry, Katkins, uh, does David think this attempt at getting to the truth will be successful? And if so, why? I think it would be successful if people in Congress exercise their authority more. Um, the Defense Department essentially works for them and us, the people. Um, if there are people in the Defense Department who are lying and covering this stuff up, which they actually they ab absolutely are, um, and and civilian leadership, uh, it is required that they would be aware of this stuff. Uh, go for it. <laughs> yeah. Do your job. Yeah. It, exactly. Uh, uh, OXO Mad Dog, OXO, would you publish the letters you received from Arrow so that everyone can read their responses? No, I'm not going to do that. Um, I've got my copies here, and they're going to remain with me. But uh, I can read read those responses for. I really don't want to. I, I, I'll read my responses. But I've already read to you part some of that, the invitation and, and some of that, but yeah, maybe I'll release it someday. Talk about it. I, I think people would certainly. I mean, those, 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 those responses I received from Arrow needs to be looked at by someone else for sure, because uh, it was very upsetting to me for me to read them. That's, um, yeah, that's understandable. And, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that offline. Um, uh, uh, bring, uh, bring out the rum. Love that. Uh, David, would you, Salas, and Dr. Bob Jacobs be willing to publicly testify as Grush has in front of Congress? Yes, no doubt. And there's many others who will, too. Um, you know, when I say McMinnville uh, last year, the last last time they had a, a, a function, um, there were two reporters there. No, this was two years ago. They had two reporters there from Washington D.C., and they were on stage. And uh, later on, I approached them. I said, "You know, if you really want this stuff to come out into the open, you need to talk to some of these people uh, that signed." Uh, um, uh, these agreements and, uh, and, and free them up from their agreements. And once you free them up, which Arrow never did, I still have that agreement still hanging over my head. They never canceled it. In fact, they told me it's not voided and it won't be voided. Why? Uh, those, those agreements that were signed, uh -huh. um, and 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 us talking to Arrow, those agreements were not voided. Wow. Those agreements still exist, and they they indicated that they're still active. It was just our interview. They said uh, it was okay. <laughs> did it, it, did, did How you? How they put it. Did you have to sign a non-disclosure agreement about the interview or a verbal non-disclosure agreement? No. Okay. They sent me a, a notice about legal things that I had to look out for. But uh, and can you all they said is, all they said here was, like I said before, Arrow was deemed by the declassification control office, both the DOD and ODNI, that is an authorized disclosure. What what could you say about what those legal things were that they said to you that you had to look out for? 
Well, I, I read to you the warning I got. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, let's see if I can find it. I got a, there's a whole page of, Okay, uh, so it's a verbal legal agreement. Uh, wow, okay. Uh, do you agree you're a voluntary uh, participating in this oral history? Uh, purposes, blah, blah, blah. And then what is it, does it say anything? So it, it's telling you the purpose. Does it tell you what not to do and what the, uh, what the repercussions are if you violate those? Not, not specifically. It says, uh, do you understand that the transcripts and any materials resulting from this oral history will belong to the U.S. government and used in any manner consistent with federal law deemed in the best interest of, of the Department of Defense? And supposedly that included, I guess, our emails, but it didn't mention emails in here. It only mentioned it in the, in the email I received. Wow. Yeah, I... But it, no, it wasn't specific as okay. to... You know, it just says about the oral history. Uh, you you understand you may choose to answer or not answer questions and so forth. Uh, and that, no. Uh, but I needed to tell them the truth, of course. Android Paranormal uh, asks, would you be willing to speak with the Senate or Congress about your experience with Arrow and Dr. Kirkpatrick? Yes, all of us would. I'm I, sure all of us who spoke to Arrow would, definitely. I, I, yeah, I think so. I, you know, I, I'll be upfront with you. At the very beginning, I was very optimistic about Arrow, but if, if you look at the fact that how long it, I mean, that it took the, a deputy, uh, Secretary of Defense to, to jump in to get a website, uh, how whistleblowers are treated, lack of communicating to whistleblowers, what the legal mechanisms of protection are, and also what uh, investigative authorities they have. And I'm not talking title, uh, uh, you know, the Title 50 thing. I'm talking about Title 18 of being able to send in special agents. The fact that, you know, two years or whatever it is, you have no idea how to contact Arrow. You don't know a phone number. You don't know an email. The only way that you can find out uh, how to get a hold of Arrow is if you're in the government, uh, in intelligence or DOD through your, uh, your buddy network, uh, or if you have a TSSCI clearance, that means that you're going to have a JWEX email account. You can then find Arrow's contact information uh, there. But other than that, that's it. So essentially, they're trying to run, we'll just say the equivalent of the FBI tip line, but without giving out the 1-800 number. It's as, and after hearing what you've had to say, what other whistleblowers have told us off the record, the fact that you have whistleblowers filing, and we were the first to report this, uh, PPD-19's protective, uh, uh, presidential protective disclosure uh, with the ICIG, completely bypassing Arrow. And th these were quite a few people that did this. Um, and uh, it, it just, it tells yeah. you that the whole thing's a clown show. It's a farce. <laughs> yeah, it's a honeypot. That's, that's the way I look. It's a farce. And, you know... I guess I had this feeling from the beginning, and I, I, I never been confident that the Department of Defense could uh, really follow through adequately on this stuff uh, because because they have been hiding uh, back engineering and all this stuff. Uh, the, there's there's people up there who who are following this pretty closely. Yeah, I I think so, and. You know, and to just kind of wrap it up, let's make sure we don't have any more questions here. Uh, actually, oh, let's hear from Nick. A uh, question for Matt. Can he elaborate more on the secret uh, committee Arrow has commissioned? Uh, no. Um, other, <laughs> other than uh, at least to our, uh, our gatekeepers, the old gatekeepers for the legacy. 
program. Um, yeah, I'm, su I'm surprised, like I said before, I'm surprised that such a community exists. I'm, um, I'm yeah. Well, and, and uh, you know, and again, my message to, to lawmakers is, um, you know, you guys pass law that is supposed to get to the bottom of this and force transparency not only to you, but the American people. And when you have a department uh, run by a director that, you know, frankly, just doesn't seem to give a damn, you've got the wrong guy in the seat. And then the larger question Congress uh, must investigate is who is pulling the strings uh, of Arrow and then- Like the, and like then the they, people on this committee. And the people that are on this committee, uh, again- they should, uh, they should be shaking in their boots. They, they completely should. And frankly, I think uh, there are a lot of people that should end up in jail about this. Uh, you know, we live in a democracy, not uh, under a military junta, uh, bottom line. Uh, anyway, well, frank, frankly, I was willing to keep this to myself for, for 40 years and longer if necessary. But in the end, it was keeping the lie from the American people that made my decision for me that I, I needed to come out. So yeah, you're, here I am. Yeah, uh, here you are. You're a patriot and, uh, and you, you clearly love your country. And uh, much like David Grush uh, and others, uh, that have come forward and realized that there are things that are going on that uh, are not in line with uh, what how a democracy should operate. Okay, um, uh, uh, tell us, uh, how can we find your book? My book is on Amazon. Uh, and you, it's called... So right behind called, you there. Okay, great. It's called It Never Happened. And uh, let's see. It's, it's uh, U.S. Air Force cover-up revealed and it goes up through uh project sign and project grudge i'm writing volume two which is going to be on project blue book so you can get on on amazon i don't collect any revenue from this book whatsoever i do donate all proceeds to the uh air force uh, association the national air force association so uh uh i I have not marketed this book. I don't advertise it, but it's out there for people to want that are to, to get. And, uh, you know, it has a lot of good information, especially about Air Force involvement in the cover up, or especially in the early days in Roswell and so forth. Of course, it explains my incident also. So, uh, and what, what I went through in that incident, and probably more detail uh, than you care to know. The, uh, and I have to tell you, this is, I've been looking at our, at our, um, our, uh, our metrics here. This is one of the most widely watched live streams uh, in the history of the show. What would your closing, your final message or ask of the people that have been watching and listening to your, um, your testimony about what occurred? I would say, talk to your congressman. If we want to get this out in the open, you can make it happen. And that's essentially what I, I told, said in my book. You know, I've done my part. I've told my story. Now it's up to you guys to do something if you want this story out in the open and uncovered. Uh, talk to your congressman and uh, get things moving on this thing. Uh, it, it's been way too long. Um, for me, it's been over 65 years. This is really old stuff to me. Uh, the American people not need to know. Uh, uh, talk, you know, I, I tried to talk to a couple of news people who, who were in Washington, D.C., and I told them, hey, if you know some congressmen, get them involved with this. Uh, let, free the people up that, that signed these agreements to keep quiet. Free them up, and you'll find a lot of people out coming forward to, to talk. But I, yeah, as you said, I, I, I'd be reluctant to talk to anybody from the Defense Department because they're still holding back. Yeah, they're holding back and they're clearly uh, don't seem to be taking uh, taking this seriously. We're also I'm going to put uh, a, a, a Amazon link to your book in the YouTube uh, description. Um, uh, Captain, thank you for joining us today. This was 
I would say probably one of the uh, most significant interviews that we've done, and uh, I think uh, one of the most uh, significant pieces of information that we revealed today uh, about Arrow. I, uh, folks in Congress, I it's do your due gel, do your due gel, do your due diligence. Um, I would love to be proven wrong, but I I. Yeah, I don't think that's going to be the case. Uh, certainly not in this one. And uh, folks, if you enjoy, uh, if you enjoyed our show uh, and you enjoy our guests like uh, like uh, Captain Shin, uh, Shindley, uh, we encourage you uh, to hit that subscribe button and become a Patreon supporter. Uh, doing this stuff uh, is uh, not for free, uh, unfortunately, like most things in the world. So we always appreciate your your support. But most importantly, is be your own activist. Contact your members of Congress. Uh, tell them that that what uh, Captain Chinley here uh, experienced uh, from Arrow is not acceptable, and we should demand more from uh, from these uh, from these folks. Uh, they work for us, not the other way around. Uh, Captain, thank you so much uh, for your time, and uh, I hope uh, one day to meet you in person. We're going to chat thank a little you. bit uh, offline uh, about some of the other stuff. Uh, and uh, try and get you in, in, touch, uh, in touch with some folks. So uh, thank you very much, sir. Have a, have sure. a good day. Bye, right. too. Thanks, guys, for joining us. And uh, hopefully we'll probably be back around middle of November. Unfortunately, my day job is uh, sucking up a ton of time. But uh, as always, we'll come back with really top-notch guests. And uh, we appreciate you watching and appreciate your support.